mental state in Malaysia. Thank you. <laughs> if this morning we had a long discussion on culture, I'd like to take this now to a discussion on structure. I felt that uh, in this uh, debate this evening, I'd like to bring us back to the issue of the idea of neoliberalism, economic developmental models, and political systems through which affirmative action is implemented. The three models of development that we need to understand if we want to understand Malaysia's economic development. The first model of development is the developmental state, the second is neoliberalism, and the third is uh, affirmative action. And what is important about these models is the way in which all three policies have been simultaneously implemented and the impact they've had on the country has been phenomenal because of the outcomes that we will see. Now let me just define these models, what they mean. The developmental state is, was created by, the concept was created by Thomas Johnson. And Thomas Johnson was looking at Japan in the post-World War II period. And Thomas Johnson wanted to understand what brought, what brought about this major reconfiguration of the Japanese economy after the economy had been devastated after the Second, Second World War. And here are the key features of the developmental state. The most important point that one needs to recognize here is the high degree of state intervention in the economy to drive this growth. But the other important features here, the coming together of state and capital to rebuild this nation, and how the government steered economic rents, to particular uh, economic enterprises, to allow for this kind of rapid industrialization that we saw in Japan. The other issue which is extremely important was also the need for a highly, highly competent bureaucracy so that they had the capacity not only to conceive the policies, but also to deliver these policies. And the third issue, which was extremely important, was on education. And in no phenomenal attention given to education to ensure that they have the capacity to produce the human capital to drive this growth. What should also be remembered here also, the importance of trade unions. Labor was not left out. It was a, hard, it was a social compact between state, capital, and labor was extremely interesting. But what is also interesting about the developmental state is how they developed many of these ideas from the German model, the social market economy too. And we'll see features of this also in Germany. Subsequently, in the 1970s, late 1970s, a new model of development emerged, neoliberalism. Now neoliberalism, the primary movers behind this, as you know, are Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. But to understand the rise of neoliberalism also one needs to go back to history and look at the post-World War II period in Europe. In Europe, as I mentioned earlier, we had the case of Germany and the rise of the social market economy. In England, we had the welfare state. And in the US, we had Roosevelt's New Deal. It was a new form of economic development in response to not just the World War II, but also in response to the Great Depression. But here we can see a backlash. The minute the opportunity was given in 1979 when we had a great, when we had enormous recessions, high unemployment, the rise of neoliberals who came up with an alternate form. And here we are talking about freeing up the state. The ideas that Von Hayek brought to the form. And Von Hayek's ideas were, and Margaret Thatcher espoused this, let's do something about freeing up the market. Let's deregulate, let's privatize. And these were the key features. But one important other feature of neoliberalism was the way it went about impairing the trade unions. One of the first things that Margaret Thatcher did when she came to power was to go after the unions. And one of the first things that Reagan did when he came, after the, came into power was also to go after the unions. But what is also important was the discrediting of neoliberalism post in the global financial crisis period. And enormous implications in terms of the fraud that neoliberalism had on the developing world was clear for all to see. Although there were numerous attempts to discredit neo neoliberalism prior to the global financial crisis, this fell on deaf ears until the global financial crisis. Now, the third important policy that we must understand is that of affirmative action in Malaysia. It defines Malaysia. It was a policy that configured the way the economy developed. And here we can see whether we were implementing the developmental state model to drive industrialization, or whether it was neoliberal policy that was introduced, affirmative 
affirmative action was the constituted dimension of these two policies too. And here the idea was to target uh, a particular ethnic community, the Bhumiputras. Bhumiputras in English means sons of the soil. It refers primarily to Malays, but it also includes other indigenous communities. And it had a bearing, the way in which rents were created and then channeled to Bhumiputras had a bearing in shaping how capital was formed and subsequently developed. One of the other core constituents of this policy was policy implementation was in, involved selective patronage to nurture melee owned big businesses. The idea was on big capital because of the idea of creating huge melee conglomerates. Now the study has got two core issues. The first one, what I'm trying to do here is to draw attention to the fact that these were diametrically different developmental policies. While the developmental state called for great state intervention, neoliberalism called for the removal of the state from the economy. Completely different in terms of how they were constructed, orientation, <coughs> ideology, and yet they both deeply influenced, influenced policy planning. What is clear here <coughs> is that when we look at the developmental model in Malaysia, it was a purely pragmatic state. It didn't matter, ideology didn't matter. If it worked, I'll try it, and why not? And in this case, we have to also look at the fact that when we look at the actual meaning of these policies, and when we look at how they were implemented, we're talking about a very selective state. By this I mean that the state did not implement these policies in its entirety. These policies were selectively implemented, picking and choosing what they meant. So here what we're trying to do is to explore the impact efficacy of these developmental strategies on the economy in a multi-ethnic multi dimension. So in terms of method, and I'm glad this has come up in our earlier discussions this morning, history matters. And I mentioned it in my opening talk, we want to contextualize this. So we want to see how in history these policies were implemented. And what were the implications of these policies over a period of time. And we will see changes in the way these policies were implemented as we try to see sequencing in defining moments in Malaysian history. And here what we also want to draw attention to is how the elites racialized identity to allow for the promotion of certain development plans that he had in mind. And here we also try then to decide to see who then benefits from these policies. So let's go back in history and let's go back to, let's, let's take independence, 1957. The moment and when, in 1957, when independence was given to us, there were three major communities, of course, the country I mentioned at the Bobi Putras, the majority community, the Chinese, which constituted 26% more at that time, and Indians 8%. The remaining were other small minority groups. In terms of equity ownership, it was very clear that the primary owner of capital was the British. Foreign equity, they were the key players. The Chinese were seen to be ubiquitous but they were mainly small and medium scale enterprises. And they were 23% of the economy. But because of their ubiquity, it was presumed that the Chinese were the key players in the economy, when in actual fact it was the British. And Indians and Malays, if you look at the level of equity ownership, it was meager, 1%, 2%. Now the reason why there was no change in equity ownership patterns by the year 1969 was because of a compact made between the British and the political elites in Malaysia at the time of the the Malays, led by the United Malays National Organization, the Hegemony Party and the ruling coalition, were reluctant to, relink, to remove the British from the economy in a major way for the simple reason they thought that that space would be like occupied by ethnic Chinese capital. But that was a fallacy, of course, because Chinese capitalists were themselves in contestation with each other. But also we look at other issues of the time, poverty incidents, very high among Malays and Indians. The Malays had been left out of the developmental plans during British colonial rule. This was a great social injustice done to the police, and it was something that needed to be ratified. And by 1969, when there was no attempt to rectify the social injustices of colonial rule, it led ultimately to race riots in 1969. And one consequence of that was the new economic policy of affirmative action primarily to help the Bobby Putras. And here are the NEP objectives. It was a 20-year plan, ultimately to achieve national unity, and the idea was to reduce poverty regardless of race by raising income levels and increasing employment opportunities for all, and to restructure society so as to reduce identification of race with economic function. But one of the core issues of the new economic policy was this issue of 
redistributing equity so that 30% of equity was in the hands of Ubud by the year 1990. This be became the defining notion of what the NED meant. And to do that, the government created a lot of public enterprises which were later called government-linked companies, which was seen to be a mechanism through which they will acquire equity primarily from the foreigners and then redistribute it to the Ubud at a later point in time. In 1970, when the, economy, when the new economic policy was first introduced, the emphasis was on education. What they did was they took poor children out of the rural areas, sent them to very good residential schools. And these students were given sound primary education. These students were then sent to the local universities, which were very good universities, and that's all subsequently <coughs> sent abroad. And these students now then became the new middle class. If there's one success story of the affirmative action, it's the creation of a well-trained, well articulate, confident, capable woman for the middle class. And this was a success story that many countries wanted to follow. So there's much to be said about the effectiveness of new economic policy, especially when the focus was, in, was on education. But 10 years later, in the early 1980s, a new government was formed. A new government was formed in the sense that there's been no change of government in Malaysia since independence. But there was a new prime minister, a highly visionary prime minister, if you like, but also who later became extremely authoritative. And his vision of affirmative action was completely different. While he did not undermine what education was trying to do, he also felt that he had to pay more attention to the economy. And for him, economic <coughs> parity between ethnic groups meant that if, for example, there are 10 Chinese millionaires, there should be 10 Malay millionaires. It doesn't matter if that 10 Malay millionaires captured a majority of the wealth. But for him, that was like family. And he had other visions too. He wanted to have a highly industrialized nation state. And for that, he looked to Japan, the developmental state model. But he was also deeply enamored by neoliberalism. He was deeply enamored by the policy of privatization. And he saw privatization as a policy through which he could redistribute this wealth to a select group of people, to create those Malay capitalists, this new Malay rich that he wanted to create very quickly. And they benefited from privatization. And so he also looked to the concept of picking winners, following the South Korean model. In the South Korean model under Park Chung-hee, the attempt was to selectively patronize a small group of people to create huge conglomerates that could compete internationally. And Mahathir liked that model because the Park Chung-hee model in South Korea was also an authoritarian model. And it was highly successful. And that's important too because South Korea in the 1950s and 1960s was dirt poor. It was so poor that it was even way behind Malaysia in terms of economic development. But today look at South Korea. And where South Korea is at point, look at where Malaysia is. So the idea of South Korea and picking winners was an was an idea which he was deeply enamored by, and the idea of a strong state to nurture huge enterprises came from this East Asian country. The ideas came from East, this East Asian country. And a new rich did emerge. By the year 1990, when the economy, when the new economic policy was supposed to have come to an end, equity had been redistributed. And 90% of it, 19% of it, was in the hands of the poor. Let me tell you that this figure of 19% has been deeply contested. The figures have been fudged according to some critics. They take the equity value at par value, not at market value. And of course, if you take it at par value, then the value falls. If it's not at market value, or if you take it at market value, it will be way past the 19% figure. And who are these people who own it? The GLCs or the public enterprises were not included in this equation. And if you include that, you surpass the 30% 30, 30 figure. Why the 30% figure? If we surpass the 30% 30, 30 figure, then we have to question, do we still need a positive action in this country? So even till today, this was 1990, now we are well into 2012, the figure is still 19%. Okay, it's gone up to 20%. The figure is not changing. Because if it changes drastically, then we have to go back to the drawing board and review this policy. So when we look at the outcomes of the new economic policy of affirmative action, the goals have been met. There's been a significant reduction in poverty among the beneficiaries, from 65% in 1970 to 3% in 2010. Phenomenal success on that score. 
increased opportunities for the targeted group, no doubt about it. And a prosperous, prosperous middle class has emerged. Definitely the case. However, there have also been negative outcomes. These negative outcomes clearly indicate while the firm defection has been successful, not all, it is not, it's not a proper reflection of the reality of the outcomes. What is clear now is new intra group inequalities have emerged. Intra bumi putra inequalities have emerged. Poverty levels have fallen, but income and wealth disparities among bumi putras has increased to a huge figure, unprecedented. Spatial inequalities have also emerged. By this I mean the poorest states in our federal system happen to be also Bumi Putra dominated states. How is that possible? If this was a policy targeting Bumi Putras, then there shouldn't be the spatial disparities that we see here now. So this raised important questions about the outcomes of how the fashion has been implemented. But it also indicated the rise of a politically powerful group, a subset within the targeted group group became extremely powerful and this power, political power, was also used to make them economically well off. And these people are also the most strident supporters of the new economic policy. In 1997, that was a defining moment. When the currency crisis occurred, the shallowness of this model of development was exposed for all to see. While the new rich had emerged by the mid-1990s, in 1997 they collapsed. While their rise was phenomenally fast, the fall was even faster. So, the time had come for reforms. In the year 2003, Mahathir Mohammed stepped down as Prime Minister after being in power for more than 20 years. And it was clear the country was ready for change. And the new Prime Minister, although from the same party, articulated a vision of change. That vision of change inspired the nation and brought about a massive swing in support for the government. This was a government under stress. By the time Mahathir had left, he had already been exposed to serious political challenges, first during the major economic crisis in 1986, and subsequently after the, global, after the currency crisis in 1997, it led to what was called the reformas, a Reformation. Major protestations against the government or on allegations of corruption, rent-seeking, and hypocrisy. He survived them all. Indonesia fell. We thought Malaysia would fall too. It didn't. He barely survived. And subsequently, he stood down. And when he stood down, his deputy, Abdullah Ahmad Badawi, articulated a vision, I said, as I said, of a new Malaysia. His, his vision inspired the nation because he talked about eradicating corruption and about creating a new inclusive nation state. In that election in 2004, it was a phenomenal swing, the best ever victory for the ruling coalition at the time. But he also changed the direction in terms of growth. As far as capital was concerned, his focus was no longer on big business, but on small and medium scale enterprises, SMEs. But there's one thing he did not change. He did not review the policy of mixing business and social policies. And he retained affirmative action. And it became a cornerstone of his policy to help small and medium scale enterprises. And he had numerous vendor development plans just to help these small and medium scale enterprises. <coughs> and the idea was to link up with multinational companies and to learn by doing and by learning from them, you yourselves become independent uh, enterprises. It didn't happen. Because the people who were given the concessions to link up with multinational companies didn't have the capacity to perform. They didn't have the capacity to compete. And so when he left, it was very clear that his attempt to create small and medium scale enterprises was as unsuccessful as Mahathir's attempt. To, to create large-scale enterprises. And when he left, we were then confronted with a global financial crisis. When he left, he was forced to stand down because he had lost, in the, he had lost big, nearly lost power, in fact, in the 2008 election. He was deeply punished for his agenda for change, for not delivering on his agenda for change. And the new prime minister came in, Najib Razak, with a whole slew of public policy plans. We had the 10 Malaysia plan, we had the new economic model, we had the economic transformation plan, we had the government transformation plan. We just got lost with this whole range of public policies that he foisted on us. And one has to ask the question, what was the basis of all these plans? The idea was about reform too. Again, the discourse of reform, of change. And he talked about a new concept called One Malaysia, 
I will be a Prime Minister for all Malaysians. We will transcend ethnicity. Why? Because the electoral trends had clearly indicated that Malaysians were ready for change. On two occasions they showed it, during the reformacy which nearly overthrew the government and subsequently in 2004 when they voted for the government because the government had promised change. And 2008 when they didn't deliver, they nearly voted the government out of power. This was a society ready for change. And this was the lesson that the government had learned. And this explains the whole slew of policies that was introduced. But if you look at these policies very carefully, you will find that they are ignoring this truth. There's nothing fundamentally different in the policies that were delivered to us under this so-called new economic model. We still had neoliberal ideas. We still had market. We still had affirmative action, even though there was a big debate as to whether we should have affirmative action in business. But he called it market-friendly affirmative action. That is an oxymoron. There's no way affirmative action can be market-friendly. Our history has shown that. But it showed how difficult it was for the government to remove its policy. They become so deeply embedded. So what are the lessons that we can learn from past policies? The lessons, the most important lesson is this. Race-based policies impact negatively on enterprise development. As far as Malay politics is concerned, the politics of patronage has become deeply embedded within the political system. And as far as non-Malays are concerned, especially the Chinese are concerned, there's great fear of expropriation of your wealth and the fear of the interest. And in terms of the hegemonic party, the United Malays National uh, Party organization, it's very clear it's deeply factionalized. The factionalism is not based on ideology. The factionalism is based on patronage, on money politics, and who has access to rights of the state. And this has led to serious contestations which we have seen in the party first in 1990, when the contestation led to the creation of a new coalition, and then subsequently again in the reform RC in 1999. And these political crises have reshaped the nation, there's no doubt about it. There's open state society contestations going on right up till today. But this, it starts way back in 1990. But it's becoming extremely clear now in the more contemporary period. The government has talked about reforms of affirmative action. It knows they have to reform. But it has not instituted change where there's significant institutional changes to ensure that checks and balances exist. There's been no devolution of power to institutions to ensure there are checks and balances in the system, which clearly shows the lack of political will on your part to reform this policy to make it far more transparent. But the other important lessons here too, we are supposed to be a highly industrialized economy, but we are stuck in a middle income track. We are stuck in a middle income track because we just can't move up to that higher level. And there are clear problems for that. If you look at our industries, there are no new technologies in our new industries. If you look at R&D, there's very little investments in R&D to move us up the technology. Okay? And why are there these, why is it so poor, these investments in technology? These are the reasons. One of the issues are the brain drain. We were having a talk earlier. What do you do when you're faced with this kind of system and discrimination and politics of patronage and oppression? Well, for the middle class, you can always leave. And we have a serious brain drain problem in our country. And one of the countries who has benefited from this is, of course, the United States of America. Even this great university, this department, Ng Ho, one of our best minds is in Duke University. How I'd love to have Ng Sing Ho back at the University of Korea. It would have been nice to hear what Ng Sing Ho would have to say about my presentation today. Which brings me to the second issue also, the massive decline of the reputation of our universities because of that brain drain. Brain institutions can see the decline manifestly, very clear in the, in the departure of some of our best minds. The issue of the quota-based system and how it has led to a decline in the quality of the students that we get. And now the big problem in Malaysia is high unemployment rate among our graduates. And why? Because our graduates can't speak English properly, they can't even speak Malay properly. They are poorly trained, they are poorly educated. And whose fault is that? It's an education system that is in deep decline which is now led to the loss of this generation. We have not got the kind of human capital that can drive economic growth. These are serious problems. We have just, the government has just released an education blueprint for change, recognizing the serious state of education in our country. And this also, as I said earlier, explains why there's little progress in terms of R&D and why the economy is stuck in the world. So what can we say here from this? Affirmative action, development, and politics. 
as I started my discussion, I said today, when I started this discussion, I want to move away from culture and I want to talk about structure. And when we look at structure, we begin to see certain things. When we look at the structure of the state, and we look at how it has been implemented, the developmental state model, if you compare Japan and Korea, and they talk about linkages, industrial financial linkages, that have been extremely sustainable and has driven that growth. We don't see those linkages. Those linkages which have brought about equity and redistribution and a decline in poverty in Japan and South Korea, we don't see in Malaysia. And in terms of neoliberalism, where we hear with neoliberalism, it has failed to create an entrepreneurial community in our country, a new entrepreneurial community. But it still remains very much here on the drawing board. Although it's very clear that there are serious wastages that come to preferential treatment using affirmative action. In terms of institutional decline, I've mentioned it earlier, the serious decline, long-term implementation has led to serious institutional decline of some of our major public, public institutions. So there's a need now to make a distinction between what I call developmental affirmative action and preferential affirmative action. I think de developmental affirmative action is the lesson we need to take away from this. And when we talk about developmental affirmative action, I'm talking about developmental affirmative action in terms of education. Education primarily to young children from a very young age. That's the key lesson we can take away from this. But it's also the idea of duration within a specific period of time. In terms of policy mixing, looking at creating Bumiputra capital and redistributing wealth, trying to achieve both social and economic goals simultaneously, it just doesn't work. The focus should have been just on education, the new middle class, if they want to go into business, let them go into business. If they have entrepreneurial capacity, they will have the capacity to do so. But what is also meant by mixing these policies is that when we do have entrepreneurial capacity, they have been marginalized, they are fearful of investing in the economy because they fear expropriation of their wealth. But we cannot forget this. SMEs constitute 99.2% of total domestic enterprises in the country. You have to engage with them. You have to bring them into the development process. And what that means is we have to review the issue of property rights. Ownership and control is fundamental. And if you want to get the SMEs to invest in the economy, you must have a secure, transparent, and accountable infrastructure. Economic crisis have shown us this. Economic crisis have shown us that we have to engage with these enterprises. Economic crisis have also shown us that it can lead to political crisis. And what we have seen from the political crisis in the, in the post-2008 is that the government, after the 2008 election, clearly recognized that there was a need for political reform. There was a need to liberalize ethnic-based ownership regulations, but they have not acted to do so. Why? Basically because they cannot bring themselves to seize the politics of patronage. Because this politics of patronage is what has allowed them to continue to remain rich, as well as retain power. The very fact, however, that AMNO can retain power in the next election, and the election can be called any time now, is the fact that they continue to divide and rule using ethnically based politics. They continue to racialize their discourses, and one of the core issues through which they racialize their discourses is through the policy of affirmative action. And as much as we can talk about how there's a new sense of change, a feeling of change in society, a feeling of wanting to have a more democratic system, of a system which is non-racialized. The fact of the matter is, if you go down and to the ground and you say, especially with the Trust, there can also be no longer a firm fashion along race lines, along ethnic lines, then you're going to have a problem. There are still many Bumiputra Trusts who say, no, we want democracy, we want non-racialized politics, but we also want a firm fashion along ethnic lines. And this is proving to be extremely complicated and divisive in terms of trying to bring about political change. So the conclusion, we must consider the type of institutions that have been created through which affirmative action has been implemented. It has to be based clearly now on needs. Interestingly enough, the opposition party, it's multiracial in, in its orientation, is talking about this. A new kind of politics, a new kind of affirmative action. Let's target anyone who needs help. In terms of uh, the electoral system, it's clear that we need a more democratic electoral system. The time has come for political reform. It is universally recognized, and it can only happen if there's real change of government. The issue of decentralization is clearly necessary because there are spatial inequalities in this country that need to be addressed. This is a federal system. 
And a federal system means that states like, like say here in the US, should have power devolved to them to allow them to make decisions based on their own particular context. That is not happening. We don't, we may be a federal system in name, but we are a unitary state in practice. And there are important issues here about decentralization and how it should occur to allow for these changes to occur. And at the level of the local level, the idea now is about civic institutions that transcend ethnicity to curb this political pra practice of using race for or patterns of political mobilization. This time has come. Whether we have reached a moment of change, we will know in the next general election. And all indicators, indications are that moment has come. And UMNO, which remains one of only two single dominant party states in the world, may find that it has also lost power in the next election because of the manner of implementation of the public election. Thank you. Thanks very much. Our next speaker um, is Stephen uh, Ratupa. He's a political sociologist at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. He has worked at the Australian National University, the University of the South Pacific, and um, it has been a consultant for a number of international organizations, including the UNDP. He's published widely on affirmative action, ethnicity, military coups, and political change. He's president uh, of Pacific Islands Political Science Association. The title of his talk today is Neoliberalism, Racial Preferences, and Political Elite Women. No, that's not what we tell you. No. title is right here. He's joining me in the Sure, how I'm going to keep you awake. Have a nice lunch, <laughs> and the sun is going down. I have a beautiful, brilliant presentation this afternoon. So I'm not sure how I'm going to keep up with your um, declining spirit of interest as you begin to look forward to the dinner. But uh, uh, three things that I'll do. First, let me explain why uh, this particular uh, topic is different from the original one. Uh, I just later realized that the original one uh, had been submitted uh, for publication and that I had to quickly change so that uh, if this comes out for publication, at least it looks different. So that's why uh, they're very different. And uh, secondly, it's very, very uh, appropriate that Fiji is falling Malaysia because all the years, uh, since the early post-colonial days, a lot of Malaysian experiment what is to do with constitutional uh, political governance or from the election was actually <coughs> downloaded from Malaysia. So we downloaded both uh, the structure, the norms, and the problems which Malaysia had faced over the years. And uh, now thirdly, what I'm trying to do by way of introduction is, and continuity as well is to pick on some of the significant issues raised earlier today and see how they link to the situation in Fiji, a uh, very highly racialized a very conflict prone society which over the years has evolved uh, into perhaps people, uh, one of the writers say, something which the world, the world should not follow. Uh, in 1986, Pope Paul came to Fiji and said, This is how the world should be. And then, uh, but he spoke one year too early. So we had a first military coup one year later. And since then, things have unraveled uh, in different ways and different. Uh, you know, uh, circumstances. Now, the first point I want to raise is the issue of uh, uh, of, of contextuality, of contextual. Uh, you realize that perhaps the Malaysian and South African and Fijian and American and Indian context are very different. In the context of Fiji, uh, there are some lessons you can draw from each other, from the other case studies, but there are some very specific and unique circumstances, historical, political, dynamics, uh, which have to be seen in the context of Fiji's particular in, uh, history. And secondly, it's a question of uh, cohesion was raised this morning. One of the justification for affirmative action in Fiji over the years has to do with trying to create a cohesive multiracial society. Uh, and the, one of the underpinning uh, justification 
is that affirmative action has to have a conflict resolution angle as a way in which you try to mediate the major ethnic groups, uh, particularly in the area of economic disparity, because ethnicity and, and economic development and economic distribution uh, intersect in a very, very significant way, in a deeply divided way uh, in Fiji since the colonial days, and certainly will spill over into the post-colonial era. And uh, the issue of uh, the multiplicity of factors, you're not just talking here about race and ethnicity, but you're talking about religion, and you're talking about culture, in its different manifestations, and the whole notion of indigenousness, and the whole notion of diaspora, and how these are played out in the political arena. And then you have uh, issues of gender, uh, cross-cutting issues, which complicates the conflict situation in a very, very small country. Now, one of the dilemmas of affirmative action, one of the issues raised today had to do with, on one hand, the issue of equity and how affirmative action tries to address equity. But at the same time, what has happened in Fiji is that while equity has been, again, one of the driving ideological considerations, it has created conditions for inequity within the target group. And uh, uh, that has been one of the issues, one of the questions raised over the years is whether affirmative action is actually <coughs> desirable in terms of the outcome which is being delivered, or is it something which replicates, which reproduces the inequality in society. And the issue of majority-minority is also significant here. In the case of the United States, the minority, uh, the designated categories. I don't want to use target groups, because target groups coming from Fiji which is very highly militarized, I'll talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like the demilitarized terminology. So instead of target group, I say, or bullet point. <laughs> <laughs> you, you say designated categories, designated groups, or, um, or just points rather than bullet points. Now, so Fiji is one of those like South Africa and like Malaysia, where the majority is not only the designated category, they also hold political power as a means and leverage by which they try to achieve economic parity and in some cases actually create the hegemonic conditions for domination in the context of ethnic uh, relationship. Now, again, in the case of Fiji, uh, uh, the, 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 the term affirmative action as a policy prescription has been raised throughout the, the day. Uh, in the case of Fiji, it's much more than simply policy prescription, I suppose something like Malaysia, where affirmative action is actually part of a major social engineering exercise to try and restructure society, to create a new middle class and displace, if you like, the dominant existing um, structures uh, as a way of creating a new order. And we'll see that in much more detail uh, later. So rather than just a simple policy prescription for equity, it's actually a process of social engineering, process of transformation as a means by which they try to achieve that equity like outcome. And much of the, the focus of my, of my paper is actually on ethnic nationalism. My friend Ralph talked about the significance of ethnic nationalism in the context of affirmative action. Uh, surely, in some of the uh, post-colonial context, ethnic nationalism being a creation, Frankensteinian creation of British colonialism lived on in different phases, in different guises and very much drives affirmative action, particularly Fiji, in a particular way which you cannot no longer differentiate between ethno-nationalism and affirmative action. Affirmative action becomes liberal for ethno-nationalism, and ethno-nationalism becomes the vehicle for the delivery of affirmative action. Now, and who defines ethnic groups, and who defines affirmative action, who defines what is good for others, something which was raised earlier this afternoon, there have been attempts in Fiji to officially define different <coughs> groups, but it failed fundamentally because although you may shift officially designated categories uh, in the books, but it, it does very little to actually transform people's sense of subjectivity of how they define themselves, either internally within the group or how others define a particular group from outside, and the internal external definition of boundaries is one of those complex areas, particularly in the provision of affirmative action. Uh, when they tried to define who is a Fijian uh, for the purpose of affirmative action in the 1990 constitution, 
it failed because it marginalized those with fetal blood. Uh, was regarded as being very sexist because those, uh, if, if you're supposed to have a, a Fijian male uh, line of, you know, a bloodline, then you're regarded as Fijian. But if you have female bloodline, then you're regarded as non-Fijian. So, uh, so the whole complexity of defining who is who is very political, very ideological, very much driven by the interest of power. Now, and the difference, the, 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 if you like, the tension between equity and human rights, which is raised today, is something which has been very characteristic of the Fiji Affirmative Action as well, where the proponents of affirmative action talk about equity, and then the opponents will use the human rights angle, particularly not so much, uh, is raised today by uh, uh, Professor French, uh, not so much the, if you like, the, human, the United Nations human rights, broader concept of, of cultural rights, but in a very narrow, uh, libertarian, legalistic notion of human rights. Um, so the, the, that tension continues. Even the Fiji Human Rights Commission, which was set up many years ago, uh, argued from a very legalistic viewpoint and said that affirmative action is actually uh, an abuse of human rights. So uh, uh, the debate within the areas of rights continued. The racialized categories, uh, Fiji is probably, according to some of the observers, like uh, my friend here, Ralph, who's written so much about Fiji, you will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and it's probably one of the most racialized countries in the world in terms of the way in which the political structure, social structure, and the economy is being configured. Political parties are based on race, and uh, the political <coughs> ideology of contestation are based on who controls power, whether it's the Indians or Fijians. And that uh, is part of the, the, the if you like, the vicious of that with the, the coups, the military coups that we've had. And last but not least is the, the notion of commodification of raciality. It's a brilliant concept because in the context of affirmative action uh, and the sellability or the level of being commodified and the level of, of recognition of a particular value um, in racialized form is very much part of the Fijian uh, system of affirmative action as well where uh, being, uh, because the notion of, of uh, Fijians talk about we have to have uh, affirmative action to give us the, uh, the ability to run business like the Indians. So being an Indian, or the Indian value, the Indian norm, or being business minded is supposed to be of high economic value. But on the other hand, being, uh, being, being Fijian gives you greater political value uh, because of association with land, association with political power. So, whether well, it's political commodification, whether well, it's economic or social commodification, uh, in many ways, this is very much racialized in the context of Fiji. Now, that's my way of introduction. And now my speech begins. Give me a <laughs> <laughs> Now, what I'll probably do, just start, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Fiji, I'll try to uh, bore those who are familiar with Fiji by giving some of the basic historical, uh, colonial, post-colonial context. Uh, as a build-up to its really the focus of my paper, because I have presented the papers on affirmative action and written on affirmative action Fiji, uh, you know, uh, all over the place. And uh, um, what I tried to do was just update what I presented in Malaysia, which is coming out in the form of a book. Uh, uh, Terence and I have been part of this global uh, uh, series of, of conferences. The first one we had in London, which is run by this quantitativist sociologists from Oxford and Cambridge and facilitated by the uh, British Academy. Everything, affirmative action was supposed to be reduced into figures, into numbers, econometrics, and all those things. And then uh, if you make a subjective statement, can you reduce that into <laughs> and all those things? And then we ended up frustrated. So uh, now, um, so how do you change? Now, what are, try to look at is to kind of frame, the, theoretically, the relationship between economic nationalism, economic nationalism, and affirmative action, Fiji, uh, something which is very much at the core of the way in which, core in which affirmative action needs to be understood. Uh, economic nationalism, like I said earlier, has been driving affirmative action in a significant way. Uh, and economic nationalism, you, often economic nationalism and affirmative action are, in the case of Fiji, they define together. Uh, in fact, although they're supposed to be separate in terms of the way in which you frame them, 
But because of the, if you like, the racialized nature of economic development or politics in Fiji, uh, all the time, they're so intertwined in a significantly different way that it's very difficult to separate the two. No, and then what I'll do is throw in the notion of, of military development. Fiji has been, is, is, is gone through those of you familiar with Fiji. There are a number of things which uh, Fiji is very well known for. Fiji is seeing the Gulf. Uh, 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 and secondly, is Fiji water. Uh, if you, those of you staying in the hotel, uh, you see a bottle of Fiji water yeah, on the table. Yeah. Uh, it's very expensive. It's five dollars or something. Uh, yeah, of course, a very good uh, tourist destination. Please come. <laughs> no, the military development is what I call a very syncretic political discourse, very syncretic political framing. Syncretic in the sense that it's all kinds of diversities in terms of contradiction and in terms of accommodation. Contradiction and accommodation take place simultaneously in a particular space. So you have coercion on one hand, then you have populism, while they use the gun at one level. At another level, they use very, very thorough penetration of society and transforming people's thinking through high-level, uh, if you like, manipulation of a mind. Uh, then you have, on one hand, neoliberalism, then interventionism as well, taking place simultaneously, uh, and preferences as well. So, uh, one cannot really talk about military development in terms of some straitjacket framing, when in fact, it's very much part of a syncretic approach to all sorts of things. Now, now one of our direction is generally, I mean, I'm not going to go into the details of defining and the whole debate about the form direction, uh, because that's been done this morning. And uh, I've spent the last uh, decade or so uh, involved in debates about form direction. I'm not going to go into the territory at this point in time. But one of the, just to differentiate between economic nationalism and affirmative action. Uh, well, affirmative action has, if you like, generally a positive vibe about is how it's framed. It's due with preference of policy for the disadvantage. Uh, economic nationalism actually has two components to it. One is the, the broader issue of protectionism, state protectionism. That's not the, that's not the uh, economic nationalism I'm talking about. But I'm talking about the second definition, the way in which economic development, or way in which preferential development is linked to ethno-nationalism and the belief that a particular community deserves to be developed and the belief that a particular community has the natural right. In fact, in the case of Fiji, the notion of the permanency of Fijian interest uh, is very much linked to the idea that uh, indigenous Fijians have the natural right to have access to state resources. Uh, it was something which the British uh, in the colonial uh, empire were able to, if you like, uh, to reproduce in the minds of many Fijians in the context of the, the colonial economy, and then over time it became embedded in the political discourse of, uh, uh, of the country. Now, uh, those, again, those of you who are not familiar with Fiji, uh, the indigenous Fijians, or Itoke, they constitute about 57% of the population. It's been increasing to almost 58, 59, maybe 60 percent now. And the uh, Indo-Fijians, uh, the workers were brought in from India by the British to work in the sugar plantation, about 37%. At one point, during the Second World War, around 1940, the number of Indians had actually superseded the number of Fijians. And one of the reasons why uh, the politics of ethnic fear, the politics of racialization of fear, was very much driven, was very much a driving force in the uh, in Fijian politics. Uh, well, exception was that Indians had economic power and now they have a numerical superiority. And if they have political power, then Fijians, or Indian Fijians, or the Toke, will find themselves uh, marginalized. Then you have other minorities consisting of uh, Chinese, of Europeans, part Europeans, and other Pacific Islanders, uh, and so forth. So, so the differences in ethnic distribution is reflected in the way in which politics is being played out, is reflected in the way in which the racialized discourse has been constructed over time. Uh, and the construction of the racialized discourse continues and very much shapes the way in which not only politics, economics, uh, take place. So uh, uh, within the post-colonial uh, era, uh, the nexus between 
and then basically, or the ethnic identity, the political identity has been one of the most frustrating, one of the most complex areas of conversation, where ethnic identity and political identity, uh, uh, which originally are separate, are actually combined and integrated in a particular way, so that your ethnic rights and political rights are associated with each other. Uh, so that if you're an Indian, you're supposed to have a certain kind of uh, perception of political rights about yourself. Or if you are a Fijian, then not only is it your ethnic, your ethnic no, identity that being a Fijian, but also you also have, uh, have certain political rights which are associated with it. Now, after independence, there was an attempt to create, the, if you like, the multiracial experiment. But one of the contradictions of multiracialism was that on one hand, you have the notion of coexistence of ethnic groups. And on the other hand, we have the encouragement uh, and facilitation of distinctiveness. So in other words, you coexist, at the same time, you remain distinctive. And that's been contradictory, because over the years, it's really the distinctiveness which overcame the coexistence uh, component. Uh, and one of the reasons why the ethnic problems are continuing. In the form of, well, we've had a lot of coups. We're following the, the American example. Uh, 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 1987, we had two uh, military coups. And then 2000, there were two. I won't go into details as to what they were. And then 2006, 2009, and a lot of underpinning these military coups were, if you like, the political contestation. Uh, and of course, the economic uh, differences and how they played out uh, in the context of, of a racialized uh, political space. Now, the very first coup was very much driven by the fact that a new political party, a new political party, the Labour Party, which came into power, although led by indigenous Fijian, was, uh, was very much um, heavily supported by the Indo-Fijian uh, population. Uh, and then it was seen as an Indian party. And then the military, which was largely Fijian, about 90, more than 90 percent of the Fijian military consists of uh, indigenous Fijians up until now. Now, uh, now, the 2006 coup was very different. The military has shifted its position from being a supporter of ethno nationalism into an opponent of ethno nationalism. So the country, so the the, uh, uh, the 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 government which was deposed was actually a an indigenous Fijian nationalist government, and the military realized that in its ideological transformation from being a supporter of ethnic nationalism to anti ethnic nationalism had to do with internal dynamics within the military itself and how they shifted the ideological position and knew when the people came in. So. Uh, now, the early affirmative action, very, very briefly, I think, well, what's time like for me? Mm -hmm. Ten minutes, good. For about ten minutes. Just to go over some of the, the significant changes uh, in relation to affirmative action. In future. See, the, the colonial affirmative action framing, or framework was very much to do with the idea of social Darwinism, that you have to integrate the savage Fijians into the mainstream economy as a way of, as a way of reproducing um, their uh, almost extinct uh, uh, community. Now, so the idea was to, they can live in communities, the communal engineering, I call it, they can live in communities, but slowly and gradually introduce them into the cash economy. And uh, some of the early um, colonial official, uh, the colonial governors were, were debating as to whether they should sell all the Fijian land and uh, make sure that the Fijians get ahead in terms of uh, uh, economic development or keep them, or cocoon them in the, in the, in the if you like, the, the, the communal uh, context. Now, in the post, let me jump now. In the post-colonial period, uh, the affirmative action was very much integrated. The term affirmative action was never used. Uh, it was very much integrated into five-year development plans. Uh, Fiji considered a series of five-year development plans uh, over the years. And uh, it was very much framed in relation to rural development and the uh, Fijians mostly lived in rural development. It was a time, particularly after independence, where it was not a good idea, it was not politically right to talk about Fijian development as such, because it will provoke a, with a multiracial experiment. Um, it will, if you like, create 
that uh, the tension creates the disharmony which, uh, uh, which was being solved. Now, now, the relationship between cause and affirmative action is very, very, very direct, very close. Now, the very first time when affirmative action became a significant policy was 1987. That's where the Malaysian model came in. Uh, when the military came in, they were great supporters of affirmative action. And one of the, the focus was really on embouchurement. In other words, you create a feature middle class to counter or to compete with a huge Indian middle class. Uh, which had the capital, which had the status within the state. So uh, a lot of resources was put into it in terms of education, uh, in terms of uh, uh, special preferences for loans and equity. And uh, a number of companies which were set up, a number of projects for family banks were actually more directly on the Bumiputra model in, in Malaysia. And one of the main champions of that of affirmative action, of movement uh, in this period, uh, uh, who later became the Prime Minister of Fiji, is now in prison. Uh, I'll talk about why. Because uh, uh, the military government later uh, really look at his case and some of the corruption, the patronage he was involved in, and the collapse of some of those affirmative action institutions, including the major National Bank of Fiji. And then uh, uh, the court investigated and found him guilty. He's now spending the rest of uh, the next few years in jail. Again, he was a victim of the affirmative action policies which he himself created. And then uh, we uh, downloaded the Malaysian affirmative action together with the patronage and the corruption dynamics which goes with it. And so I'm not sure how many Malaysian politicians have been to jail, but certainly in Fiji, uh, the Prime Minister is not in jail. So thanks very much for your contribution. <laughs> <laughs> now, after the 2000 coup, uh, there was almost like a vindication that if you don't speed up affirmative action, then you might have more coups. Uh, that was one of the justifications. Uh, you know, affirmative action as a, uh, a means by which you address enemy conflict. But it really didn't work out pretty well. Uh, the, 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 uh, the first prime, Indo Fijian Prime Minister, Mahmoud Chaudhry, came into power in the 1997 election. So, election so 1999 election. Just two years before, a new constitution, which was created, had put into place uh, social justice programs, uh, not just for Fijians, but also for other ethnic groups as well. Now, he was faced with a dilemma because the nationalists were, because he was seen to be, if you like, the well, Indian Prime Minister, and the nationalists, Fijian nationalists, were protesting all over the place. There were a lot of threats, there were protest marches, uh, all sorts of things, uh, even blew up a few things. And children realized that he had to make concession and appeasement with the nationalists. So he made a public statement that there won't be any lifting of affirmative action because for some time he has been an anti affirmative action uh, advocate. So, but it failed to appease the nationalists, and then still he was overthrown in a coup. And uh, uh, the guy in jail, Garcia, came in with a blueprint. Now, I had just come back from England at that time. And then they asked me, would you be able to draft a 50 uh, plan for affirmative action uh, for us? I said, well, okay. And then, uh, so uh, um, one of the debates, so I came up with a, well, that's not how I put it myself, but tools equity index. I created this equity index, which some of my colleagues referred to as the tools equity index formula. Now, one of the dilemmas was, should affirmative action be driven fundamentally by political consideration, or shall we, if like, quantify, objectify some of the variables and then put them through, if you like, the systematic process of uh, calculation of equity and then have an output and say, hang on, okay, now the, the, the equity index, I don't have time to explain to you. It's, a, it's not very complicated. It basically has to do with, you take the population of a country, so the, the demographic, if you like, uh, proportion, and, 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 and also look at the, the figures in terms of economic equity and see how much and how many years would it take uh, for a particular group to reach, if you like, the equity, uh, you know, the, the equity level in the next 50 years. So in the area of corporate, uh, in the area of, of corporate management, uh, the Fijians were lagging behind by something like one to eight. In other words, 
the equity index uh, of eight has to do with you have to increase participation eight times to be able to reach the 50-50 parity uh, within 50 years. So it's pretty straightforward. But the problem with, in hindsight, was that nobody listened to the beautiful document I had uh, I presented to them. So they went ahead and driven by electoral consideration, driven by other nationalistic consideration, they, uh, uh, they basically threw it aside and they led to all kinds of corruption and a few civil servants were put in jail as a result of that. Now, in the 2001 election, affirmative action became one of the significant leverage for political mobilization. It led to the huge intercultural scam and some of the uh, civil servants were thrown into jail as a result of it. And uh, um, so, so there was a series of, so affirmative action actually corrupted and criminalized the state uh, in many ways. Because it was one way in which those in power, those who had political links, realized that they can't have direct access to state resources under the guise of affirmative action, although you may not did it. Uh, and therefore, in, in the process, if you like, create, created this, if you like, the, the criminalization of the state. Now, after 2000 coup, there was a kind of significant change. When the military came in, one of the first things it tried to do was to bar to stop affirmative action for a number of reasons. One was that it was perceived to create conditions for further ethnic antagonism. At that particular point in time, it was perceived to be, um, to be marginalizing Indians. So the military was perceived by the Indian community as being the liberators, and there was a lot of support. Uh, for the military as a result of the coup. So, uh, um, and, uh, and as well as, not only was seen as being corrupt, it was also seen as uh, a hindrance to multiculturalism in the country. Now, but it's not that simple, because the military put into place a new development paradigm uh, based on a number of things. One was to abolish affirmative action, but they did not do that entirely because they reinvented affirmative action. Instead, uh, affirmative action before was based on re-engineering Fijian middle class. When the, when, the, uh, when the military came in in 2006, one of the first things it tried to do was to dismantle the Fijian middle class because it was perceived to be associated with ethno-nationalism uh, and racialization of society. So, uh, so it has shifted affirmative action away from targeting the middle class to the grassroots. And politically, the military leader wants to be, uh, you know, wants to come in to be re-elected in the next election, which is supposed to be 2014. One of the ways in which he would want to mobilize his support and legitimize the coup is by retargeting affirmative action to the grassroots at the low level. Now, uh, so, the, so the new affirmative action uh, order, as it were, was the vertical reconfiguration from the movement to grassroots development. And uh, uh, also the targeting of all those who were involved before they set up what is known as the Fiji uh, Commission on Corruption, uh, targeting people who were involved in affirmative action in the last few years, and then uh, bit by bit they've been brought to court and then to jail. So the former Prime Minister in Karasek is now in jail. Uh, there are other cases still pending, and a whole lot of people will then go through the process. So affirmative action has been tarnished in a very significant way. It's been associated with the criminalization of the state, associated with corruption, and associated with, with, um, with self-enrichment. Uh, now at the same time, talking about neoliberalism, the military has thrown in another dynamics, uh, the neoliberalization of the economy, uh, the structural reforms and policies, and interestingly, the increase in the Chinese capital over the last few years, Fiji has, after Fiji was kicked out, not kicked out, suspended from the Commonwealth because of the coups. Every time we have a coup, we get isolated internationally <laughs> and become a party state. So uh, we kicked out of the uh, Commonwealth, and also the Pacific Island Forum, which is like the regional, um, the, the regional vision of ASEAN or the African Union. So, uh, so by being isolated, uh, China, of course, looking for its global strategic alliances and then <coughs> moves in and then gives lots of aid. So a lot of those, if you like, affirmative action targeted towards the grassroots, the building of roads, 
uh, port elevation uh, of bridges, and a whole lot of other developmental uh, programs are basically funded by the Chinese. And uh, so what you're beginning to see is Chinesification, as it were, Chinesification of affirmative action in Fiji. So it has a broader implication in terms of regional security as well. One of the reasons why Mrs. Clinton and then later Obama came out of the Pacific was to see if they can reconnect with Australia and New Zealand. It has set up a military base in Australia already. They want to do that in New Zealand. So that uh, from there, then you connect with American Samoa to Hawaii, then Guam, and then Australia, New Zealand. So we have uh, this ring in the Pacific against the Chinese influence, either to keep it out, or if they're already in Fiji, they stop of Fiji being a military base for the Chinese, that it's supposed to lock the Chinese in, in Fiji. So there's a lot of strategic considerations that take place. So, uh, uh, so the link to that is, is the way in which family action in Fiji now survives fundamentally in relation to the Chinese interest uh, in Fiji. Now, although uh, a lot of the, the public affirmative action policies have been, if you like, reconfigured, except for, uh, for a scholarship, and what you're beginning to see is after the, uh, after the coup and the, uh, and the way in which the middle class was fractured, a lot of them moved to large numbers all around the Pacific. <coughs> And the future session of the middle class, if you, those of you have been traveling that well, if, you, if you're lucky enough to come around to the Pacific, uh, there's so many small island states, almost everyone, uh, some of them are heavily, if you like, staffed by the Fijian uh, middle class who have left Fiji, and uh, they have become globalized as a result of what happened. <laughs> now, now, it appears that from the dimension, again, it's being reconfigured as a way in which Fiji is going through a constitutional reform process at the moment. Uh, and from there, then you have an election. And the chair of the Constitutional Reform Commission is uh, Professor Yas Gai. Some of you probably know him, uh, who is one of the leading constitutional uh, experts in the world. Now, so the, uh, uh, so what you, oh, sorry. So, so what you're beginning to see in Fiji is a reconfiguration of affirmative action. Uh, in a way in which the military, what must serve the military interest. So from the colonial days to the post-colonial period. So my paper, uh, if you read it, uh, I think it's, uh, it's in my flash drive somewhere, uh, uh, focuses largely on the connection, into, if you like, the, the nuances between military development, affirmative action, and ethno-nationalism, and the way in which the military being a significant variable in the political equation uh, has transformed affirmative action uh, in a way which takes away ethno-nationalism, uh, if you like, de-ethno-nationalized affirmative action, but then it takes affirmative action and reconceptualizes it, reframes it in a way uh, which, in a way which, which creates its own version of ethno-nationalism, while they argue that it has been responsible, the military has been responsible for, if you like, neutralizing ethno-nationalism, one of my arguments in the paper is that no, it hasn't. It has simply reinvented affirmative action uh, of ethno-nationalism, uh, but, uh, but in, a, in a way which is detached from the middle class and focuses much more on legitimizing the military coup at the grassroots level. I know the chair wants to get rid of me from here, uh, <laughs> so we'll be happy for any uh, discussion later. Thank you very much. Thank you. So why don't we open things up to the floor um, before asking uh, Randy to give us a uh, summary statement. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that um, I had a couple of uh, a couple of questions. A, a, a question about the Fiji case, which is whether or not uh, whether or not affirmative action as a form of patron-client politics. And I'm really thinking about if you think about Latin American politics long before there was affirmative action. The truth is the distribution of resources to your own region, you know, versus another region. I mean, that's just the way politics worked in non-democratic contexts and things like that. But I'm wondering whether or not 
that's in, a, in some ways a story in these two countries is not actually a question not so much about affirmative action, but rather about the structuring of political conflict. I mean, the idea, for example, I mean, there's, I mean, there, in Venezuela, the, there was a ruler who ruled for 30 years who didn't like Caracas, and he moved the capital into his part of the country, and he gave all of the money that the state had to the people in his regions that he was allied with. And, I mean, the favoring of groups, which then creates the basis for a lot of political instability over, you know, some civil wars, change in that way. It seems very, it seems very Latin American to me in terms of like late 19th, uh, early 20th century. And the question is just whether or not that, whether affirmative action used in that way is the same phenomena as what we're talking about in other, other types of, of policies. The, the business about creating in the two countries, about creating an educated middle class from a disadvantaged, non-educated population that's largely rural and disadvantaged. That seems to me to fit well, but whether these other questions about uh, as distribution of asset ownerships and design like that, in the U.S. case, um, you know, Nixon and the creation of affirmative action, you know, there was the black capitalism element of it, which survives mostly in the United States in terms of um, uh, targeted uh, minority shares of jobs and contracts. Well, not so much minority shares or quotas of jobs and contracts, but rather some even playing field so that if a city is going to spend money on something, it needs to be sure it has a certain number of, of vendors and so on. But that's never been the main terrain. And it seems the, the whole thing about creating a bourgeoisie or creating a billionaires that are I mean, I mean, it's an interesting question, but it's not so central to, um, you know, to uh, other things. And it may just be that um, the question that I have in thinking about the U.S. or thinking as well about the language associated with it in Brazil is that the, the other case, and maybe there's more, there's obviously more than one case, but, you know, affirmative action understood as a tool of, uh, a, a, of societal integration in a democratic political order, you know, to establish something new on more equal terms that unifies the country and, cre you know, creates some larger identity. I mean, that's sort of an integrationist argument about using, you know, using uh, affirmative action to achieve the goal of integration as opposed to separatism and ethno, you know, which would be more the secessionist, ethno-nationalist conflict sort of, uh, sort of story. And, um, and it's interesting because, I mean, I, one so rarely thinks about affirmative action in relationship to these sort of cases that it's an interesting thing to, to think about. The other thing I was thinking, if, we were at, if you were thinking about the project in the long run, it would be fascinating to deal with, uh, to deal with the, the conflicts in Belgium between the, Wall the Walloons and the Flemings in terms of a society where neither side is really poorly off in comparison, but where the intensity of the conflict between the communities is such that they go for months without governments because the, the two groups are so polarized that they can't come to an agreement because they're actually trying to move towards secession. So, I mean, it's a really, I mean, the, but then this has been very interesting. I'm not, this isn't a question, it's more an observation, but I mean, it does seem to me there is a notion of affirmative action as something that is integrating and creating a larger unity within the society as opposed to a playing favorites. Uh, and I don't know whether that's, you know, just an impression that I've got or whether it's, you know, a, you know, uh, a mistaken one. Yeah, just a, oh, sorry. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for asking for a very comprehensive um, self-answered question. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, you, I mean, you, 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 you touched the, uh, uh, the how to method pretty well. Uh, I think we have to distinguish here between, say, in the context of Fiji, it's also Malaysia as well, uh, distinguish between what you call the ideological justification for affirmative action, with a whole list of positive rhetoric like integration, multiculturalism, conflict resolution. And the other level is the level of, I suppose, pragmatism and instrumentalism, how it's actually applied and how. Um, although the patronage, for instance, uh, is still justified as creating um, equity, uh, but certainly, you know, in, in many ways, the, the beneficiaries may be the elites within the, the, uh, uh, within the uh, designated category. Uh, 
uh, but it's a justification and the, uh, the spin and the ideological value which is being perpetuated, or it gives a justification, and in fact covers up the, uh, the actual implementation process. So, uh, yeah, from the direction, uh, uh, when, when, when all the corruption and preference were being revealed in Fiji, uh, the supporters were saying, hang on, but uh, the people involved, uh, they still, uh, in some symbolic form, they still represent uh, the Fijian community. Uh, and therefore, uh, you may benefit as an individual. So the assumption is that if you benefit as an individual, if you create three or four uh, rich Fijians, they're supposed to, if you like, represent uh, the whole society. So uh, uh, yes, there's a kind of, a, if you like, the disconnect between the justification on one hand and the actual implementation on the other. Well, to address your question, I'd like to come back to uh, my point about developmental affirmative action and preferential affirmative action. I've made it very clear that I think uh, if there's a developmental aspect of affirmative action with a focus specifically on education, then I think we do subscribe to the views of affirmative action. And here we can see the value of affirmative action. But having said that, when we talk about Malaysia, I think that, as I said earlier, the context matters. Uh, in this particular context, the fact of the matter is when we look at the economy, there are certain structural features that one needs to recognize. One, the high dependence on foreign direct investments to drive growth. Now, that was something that needed to be rectified. We cannot always be dependent on FDI to drive growth. Second, the high dependence on Chinese enterprises from a domestic level also, which I think the government was rather concerned about. And the third issue was, as I showed in my presentation, Within 10 years, what had emerged was, as far as domestic capital is concerned, it was government-linked companies. And the government under Mahathir was not interested in government-linked enterprises as being a major capitalist force, because he wanted individuals, Malay individuals, Malay businessmen to drive that economic growth. And there's a reason for this. If you look at Singapore, Singapore went down the same route. Singapore when the People's Action Party under Lee Kuan Yew came to power, he was very fearful of domestic capital, Chinese capital, because domestic capital was supporting the opposition. And so he created government-linked companies. And then he realized that government-linked companies were not entrepreneurial. And he had a big problem. That is the domestic entrepreneurial base that he can use to drive economic growth. So Mahathe had it, but he racialized it. And so he wanted to create Malay individual capital space. But the manner in which he went about doing it was highly problematic. Now here I brought in the developmental state model. Look at Korea and look at Japan. Look at what Korea did in terms of developing a domestic base, a domestic enterprise base, which was highly entrepreneurial, which had the capacity to compete and even go, go, go global, and even the capacity to move up the technological ladder. And I would argue, what's wrong with that? Why can't a country have a highly entrepreneurial domestic capital space? What was wrong with Mahathir was the racialization of that agenda. And that's where everything fell, fell apart. So I think in that sense, if you take away the race type aspect of it, and you just look at it from the developmental aspect, of it, and that's why I ended with the fact that if you look at the developmental state model, there are lessons to be learned here. There are lessons to be learned in terms of creating social compacts, which involve labor, state, and capital, which can work. And these compacts can bring about social change, including the elevation of poverty and the inclusion of labor and the development of plans, which can bring about major structural changes in the country. And that's why I also ended with, let's move away from the idea of race and talk about structure and a different way of looking at development. And if we do that, maybe we can create a far more just society. Thanks for both of the presentations. They were really rich and new for me at this level. Um, but I, I wanted to ask Steve if you could say a little bit more about the notion of military-led development. Um, you were talking about how Fiji had so quote-unquote downloaded much of uh, Malaysia's uh, use of affirmative action. But it seemed to me, given what Terence was saying, that you don't have this idea of the developmentalist state that 
that Malaysia enacted at some point, and that you're getting at something slightly different in terms of military life development. So I wanted to hear you say more of it, more about that. And what I got from your presentation was that there's a way in which affirmative action is used as a form of political coinage in terms of groups coming to power, and that's of course part of what the military uses to come to power. But it, is it beyond that? And then I was very struck with both of your presentations about the language of, of uh, corruption, because that's something that I'm, that I'm thinking about in India. And um, so in this country, the language of, of corruption tends not to focus on affirmative action per se, except through the referent of producing inferior or less competent, less well-trained uh, individual scholars, et cetera. But I guess my reaction was similar to John in the sense that these systems are designed to produce a middle class which will benefit and to also at that level keep others that will not rise to that middle class or creamy layer as, as the term is used in, in India. So aren't these things in fact systemic? And if they're systemic, then do we think about corruption differently? Um, and then I also wanted to hear about more about um, Fijian political leaders going to jail for corruption because that's so new. It doesn't happen in this country and it doesn't happen in India. Or in Malaysia. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Okay, maybe, uh, yeah, thanks for, I think, three questions. Uh, let me just quickly go through them. Uh, let me start with the last one. Uh, he went to jail uh, because uh, he was involved, he was one of the founders of the family connection. Uh, he helped set up the Fijian Holdings Company, which is based on the Malay uh, indigenous equity companies. And uh, so what the, one of the specific uh, things which he did was to, uh, uh, he had his own company, uh, which, and he applied, he was also the general manager of the Fiji, of the, uh, of the Fijian Development Bank. So he applied to himself to get the money from the bank for which he was general manager of his company. It sounds uh, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, he then applied for equity share to buy shares from the Fijian Holdings on behalf of his company, while he was also director of Fijian Holdings. So a uh, whole uh, mixture of you know, conflict of interest and insider trading, a whole lot of things. Yeah. So uh, there's another case following, uh, which is very similar to that. So uh, this is how I got to jail. So uh, because of the close links between those states, financial institutions, and the state bureaucracy, it's very much the same people involved. Yeah. Yeah. And they have very close links with each other. Uh, and they give loans to each other. And the investigation is still going on. Uh, in one case, he gave loan to his brother so that his brother can buy his own house. <laughs> so it became a big thing over the years. So uh, uh, at the time of the, uh, uh, when, when he was the powerful guy in government, nobody could put him to prison until the military came and said, hang on, there's something here we have to investigate. Uh, the question of corruption, I'm using the word corruption here in a very legal sense, like I just mentioned to you one, uh, which is, not in the social political sense, because world corruption is very contextually, culturally, politically, ideologically very imprecise. Uh, I'm using it in a very, very legalistic way. Uh, the case of this guy who broke the law and went to jail. So you call it corruption, um, perhaps. Uh, yeah, the notion of military development is, uh, is um, when the, when the military first came in, 1987, they were very pro affirmative action. In fact, they're the ones who were behind the affirmative action, push for affirmative action, with this guy, Garase, as the, uh, if you like, the champion, obviously. But by the time of the 2006 coup, the military had changed its ideological and political stance. It was very much against affirmative action because it was perceived to be evidently divisive. So, uh, in framing development, what they did was to put military officers uh, in the regional development, uh, what they call divisional commanders, all the divisional commanders, uh, sorry, commissioners rather, uh, colonels, and the key positions in the whole structure of 
economic development they put in military offices and the whole idea was to speed up development uh, and people like it uh, particularly the ordinary uh, villages because they ask for a road and the military gives it to them at the same time while in the whole democratic process uh, the politician will promise the road and they wait for 100 years it never turns up so that's why some of them are saying maybe the military development is better than democratic development because it produces the goods. So on one hand you have, if you like, the pragmatics. Then on the other hand you have the whole notion of democracy, human rights, whether military development, although it's faster, but because it's undemocratic, uh, doesn't make it worse. Uh, or the fact that it's faster doesn't make it better. It's interesting, it's a very familiar story in Pakistan, although that's being yeah. changed, but in Kashmir and Sri Lanka, again, that idea of military-led development is a part of this intensive social engineering, which is very repressive, yeah. and yeah. which people yeah. exist. Uh, well, I think that speaks to the issue of the concept of power, which we have not discussed yet in this conference. And I think that's an important concept. The idea of power, insofar as how does it shape the state? And I think that issue also needs to be brought into the equation. We have not discussed the evolution of the state and how power is distributed within the state. And if you look at it from a historical perspective, and I brought to bear in terms of methodology that we need to adopt a historical perspective, we need to see these power configurations as they occur over time. And what is very clear in the case of Malaysia was the concentration of power in the office of the executive and the undermining of power in different arts of government, including the judiciary, the attorney general's office, or even the police. All of them are subservient to the executive. And so the most powerful institution in the country today is the prime minister, the executive. Now, history will also show, and if you look at the literature on the developmental state, the issue of corruption looms large. And many of the analysts of the developmental state used to argue, so what if we have corruption? Look at what these leaders have done for your country. Look at what Mahate has done for Malaysia. Look at what Sukhan Suhato has done from Indonesia. So why are you complaining? <laughs> why were we complaining? Until 1997, when we showed why we were complaining. It was not sustainable. And in 1997, the whole thing collapsed. This is so reminiscent of the global financial crisis. It's so reminiscent. We don't seem to learn from our history. In fact, Mahathir once very famously said, who cares about human rights when you have 10% GDP growth rates, annual GDP growth rates? And he's right. You can have an authoritarian state, provided that authoritarian state delivers economic growth. But the minute you're confronted with an economic crisis, be careful. You can be overthrown. And Suhaka was overthrown. And Mahathir was brought to the brink of being overthrown, and subsequently left because he knew his time was up. So these are important issues I think we need to consider. The issue of power, the nature of the state, the evolution of the state. And in that process, what happens to a certain defection? It becomes a policy that is hijacked by the state. Because after all, now power is concentrated in an elite. They can so easily hijack this very progressive policy and make it their own. And that is the lesson of Malaysia. Two very eloquent presentations, both of which I think um, have some serious omissions in them. Uh, I'll begin my comment by asking you a question to which I'll return. What do you want for these two states? The creation of an integrated population and a civic government in which communal divisions are abolished? Are you trying to create a integrated state in which communal politics and identities have been abolished and have a Western kind of democracy. Now, I'm going to come back to that. But I, I think there are some biases in these presentations that need to be seriously qualified. The first one is that in both Malaysia and in Fiji, you have two communities, the Malays in in Malaysia and the Fijians in, in Fiji, who are indigenous peoples. And in some ways we could say 
look, you are the indigenous people. Maybe you have a right to rule. I'll come back to that too. But now, not only do we have two indigenous groups, but we have two indigenous groups who are living side by side with two immigrant groups, two groups who are descended from immigrants. And these immigrant groups are two very competitive, market-oriented, individualistic um, communities who know, now know how to prosper in the marketplace. They will always outcompete the Malays and the indigenous Fijians. Try it over and over, unless you want to make indigenous Fijians into individualistic types, acquisitive, market-oriented, and of course, severely alienated and Western, Western sick. Uh, now, the point, the point is, when we talk of social justice, I tried to point out to, so just this morning, that social justice is a concept that seeks to orient policy on behalf of a community that is wounded, that is disadvantaged, that is poorer, that needs help. And in both Fiji and in Malaysia, in Malaysia, who is the poor community? The, in, the, the, the Malaysians, they can't compete with the Chinese. In the case of Fiji, the indigenous Fijians can't compete with the Indians. No way. And so regardless of what's going to happen, this problem is not going to be solved so long as you have these two communities living side by side. Now, I'd like to know how you're going to fix that problem. Because um, I, you, you've got to remember that there is no way in which the indigenous Malaysians can compete with the Chinese. No way in which the indigenous Fijians can compete with Indians. They are two civilizations. The, the indigenous Fijians are the most collective, land-based, loving community, living in, a, in, living in an economy of affection and exchange. Indians are more individualistic types who are competitive, inquisitive. You, you really don't want to be caught living with an Indian on an island all by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you're not going to stop me because it's becoming painful. <laughs> now, the, the problem is, I don't, I don't like the drift of this analysis that seems to impale the indigenous peoples in their own land. So that if they happen to take affirmative action, so that they can transfer some of the wealth to themselves, maybe they've, they've done it badly, they've corrupted it, they give it to the wrong people. But, but, so that needs to be fixed, that needs, they need to, 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 but shouldn't it be redistributed? Now, here is a problem I want you to, to think about. Since the two communities, by their internal motivations, have two different ways, two levels of performance to accept for themselves, that, that chasm will never, never be bridged. So, so long as you have this post-colonial state called Malaysia and Fiji, with these two communities living in them, unless they're assimilated and unless they're integrated, they're going to be living side by side in eternal competition, eternal conflict. I want to know how you're going to fix that. The thing is, why don't you dismantle the state? Why don't you dismantle it? You know this is going to continue. All right. Now, is this something out of your, your, your remit? You don't want to think about it. Um, is, this, is this something, why don't you give these people their land? Why don't you say, hey, indigenous Fijians, this is your country. You have a whole bunch of Indians here. Um, why don't we settle them in New Zealand and California and so on? Give the land back to these people. This is the land. Give it to them. Why don't we do the same thing? I'm not saying this is a solution. But I'm suggesting to you that you, you we are sitting on a very, very difficult situation here. I want to therefore come back to the question I posed to you at the beginning. What do you guys want? You want to have a Western type, integrated, assimilated state in which you have democracy, signal 
party system, I want to sing one vote, one. I mean, are you trying to create a new society entirely? Or do you accept that whatever, if you don't accept that, then you're going to say that Fiji and Malaysia will remain, will remain deeply divided states. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt one second because we're coming close to our finishing time and Charlene Saferide is about to uh, leave us. So they're going to give us until 6.15. So oh. if you'd be kind enough to give them a moment to reply what? to your... I don't want them to reply. <laughs> <laughs> of course they have to reply. Well, before, then, before they do, yeah, let's... Um, if there are two yeah, other yeah, oh, hands okay. up, let's get this question yeah, started. Yeah, I was forward. directing my comment to Steve's um, paper, which seems to sort of imply a certain kind of acceptance of a military-led um, development that yeah, suggests, well, you haven't critiqued the perils, you know, you haven't identified the perils of military-led development of a Fijian population, and I want to not support everything that Rob said, but the idea of, <laughs> the idea of you know, identity that, that the Fijian, native Fijians have is very, it's very much tied to territory and a sense of place emerging from that, you know. Um, so that if, if, the, if, if and, and also being shaped by customary authority that was at one time, of course, incorporated within the state. And now you, you're saying basically that the, that, ha, that, re, that relationship, that link is no longer, has been dissolved by the military, you know, through, the back, through, the, through force, basically. So it's, it's a kind of anti-racialism, quote unquote, or the rhetoric of anti-racialism being carried out, implemented through force. But you have 57% of the population, as you say, that belongs to either the East Corridor or the West Corridor, it, 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 um, culturally ensconced in these communitarian uh, places. So I, I wanted to know exactly, you know, how is this um, a sustainable model that will generate a certain kind of anti um, racialism that leads into, it seems to me, a Western, a neoliberal form of development, you know, to pick up some elements of what Ralph, um, Ralph has been saying, a sort of individualistic um, idea of development. Uh, but I just wanted a comment there that here you have, you can compare these two societies, um, you know, Fiji and South Africa, there you have the dis dissolution of customary authority in one and you have the rise or the re-engineering re or the resurgence of customary authority in the other. In one, you have the dissolution as a result of, of, of armed forces and the, you know, the, the upsurgence in the other on, on, because of the rise of universal the incapacity of the South African state to actually shape that rural space. So, I mean, it's a lot there, but. We'll take one more question and then have, have your response. Um. You know, I, 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 I hear your comment as a devil's advocate comment, but earlier I was, you know, saying to Randy that one of the conversations we haven't as yet had is a conversation about the meaning of indigeneity and the politics of indigeneity in the different contexts. So that, um, you know, when, when you talk about, you know, this is the indigenous people's land, I think to myself, who is indigenous in South Africa? You know, are the descendants of immigrants? It's a claim. It's, it's, they... it's no objective fact of asserts it. It's a claim you make. Go ahead, go ahead. But for example, if descendants of, of immigrant communities, you know, are, are not immigrants. It's a claim you make and you assert, you assert it and build it up on the basis of power. I, I don't accept any kind of inherent definition of indigeneity. But I'm saying to you, you make a claim to it, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you, you have to have power to, 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 to support it. So I, I know the question you're raising is a terrifically important question, very important question. And I mean, you guys know about this question. Uh, is, is it really true that the Malaysians, the, the, the Malays are indigenous? Is it really true that, oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. How far back do you go? And are these, are they, are they, are these visitors, are these Chinese and Indians, when will they ever become indigenous? Can they ever become indigenous after so many generations? It's a very, very critical question. Very critical. Okay, we, we only have a few minutes, so brief responses and then we'll have them come back tomorrow to defend it.
I don't think we have time for a plenary debate. I'm not going to... What about the other groups? Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to my plenary discussion. Let's have a deep discussion. Let's have a deep discussion. Wait, just suspend your answer to the moral. I don't want, I don't want to suspend any answers. You don't no, want I can give you an answer answers. right now. Yeah. Now, I think the questions raised deserve an answer. Yeah. Deserves an explanation. So can I answer? I want to make this very clear. I stated, I started out by saying, Let's look at this notion of state versus society. Now, when we look at state, we are looking at institutionalized racism. If the parties themselves are race-based, and the way in which they articulate their discourses is race-based, and you have an authoritarian state which controls even the media, which controls the way in which they articulate what they are saying, what do you expect about race-based discourses? But is this exactly what's happening in society? So I want this, as I said earlier, I want to make a distinction between state and society, and I've already talked about the state, I've talked about power, I've talked about the authoritarian nature of the state and in which, in which there's no checks and balances within the system. I'm very grateful to Dimitri for bringing up the concept of indigeneity, because I plan, it, I plan to use that in my answer. This is a problematic question. Indigeneity and what does it mean? Even when the government introduced the affirmative action in 1970, they said it was for 20 years. Otherwise, that's going to raise a lot of problems about citizenship. And do we belong here? It was because the state was so powerful that in the post-1990 period, they could then continue this policy indefinitely because there were no checks and balances in the system by that time. Now, this idea of indigeneity is very important because we do not see ourselves as migrants. We may be the descendants of migrants, but we are now citizens of the state. And the second issue, the idea that there's this market dominant minorities at least are not capable of doing good in business is not sensible. <laughs> they are highly competent beliefs in business. Oh, and it, wait, let me finish. You've your chance. You have your chance. Listen, listen, we can continue no. every dinner, Ralph. No. No. You have to let him reply. You have to let him reply. Let him reply. I, 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 but he's saying that it is a minority. Uh, All right, the majority. majority. Listen, come on, that's, that's not come on. We, we let you <laughs> we let you speak, Ralph. You know there are a lot of people who agree with you, but we let you yeah. speak as long Ralph. as you want it. Let them reply. But, but, and and we can continue over dinner. Let's, let's continue over dinner. Let them reply. This, <laughs> this, no, this is a very important question. It needs to be stressed. Let's not ourselves racialize the debate. The fact is, yes, the fact is, we have a new middle class. And I said that in my presentation. And I showed you all that this new middle, that this new middle class, including a Malay middle class, is highly vibrant, intelligent, and also entrepreneurial. They are the ones who now support the opposition in large numbers too. I disagree. They are also the ones that support the opposition in large numbers. And as you can see today, if you look at the opposition leader, he is Malay. As opposed to 20 years ago, until the 1990s, opposition leader was Chinese. You can already see it in the reconfiguration of politics in the country. The, the, the new is the most racial on, of all the groups. Go ahead. The new, so the issues that we need to discuss here, which are very important, are first, what is the nature of society? Now, I made this very clear, even in my talk. Let's talk about a post-racial society. And I've talked about post-raciality even in the case of the nation. And I think these are the important distinctions that we want to put out here when we talk about state and society. And what of this new middle class? This new middle class clearly is transcending ethnicity in the pattern of mobilization. These are positive aspects that we want to bring up. Not true at all. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I think I have about six questions uh, to respond to. Uh, I'll probably just respond to three of them. I'll start off with Ms. Uh, Lin's uh, question in relation to the militarization of the yes. Now, one of the consequences, a number of things, one of the consequences of what the military has done was the, if you like, the dismantling of Fijian institutions right. uh, in a way which has, instead of undermining uh, ethnic tension, actually has the potential already uh, beginning to have resurgence of ethnic nationalism in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a big way. And the fear, I've written it somewhere, uh, that uh, one of the consequences in the future uh, is that it will re uh, resurrect uh, some of the uh, ethno nationalist feelings and tension amongst Fijians in particular, uh, which will probably make it worse later. Because what the military 
was trying to do was to use coercion force to transform. And you don't do that in the society. Uh, because what you do is that you basically make people angry. And they begin to remobilize in various other forms. And, uh, and, and secondly, there's a point that uh, the nature of, of, of military development is such that it undermines the state system of accountability. Uh, because if you have a new election in 2014 and the new democratic government will have a terrible time trying to rebuild because all the systems of governance of democracy, of uh, accountability have been destroyed uh, in, in different ways. It's not just altered, actually virtually uh, dismantled. Uh, and thirdly, is a way in which the military culture of development, uh, the danger of being embedded within the development thinking of the ordinary population. But because I told you earlier that they get things quite quickly, and if you have that in your mind all the time, that even in a democratic system, if you don't get it, you are most likely, you most likely, like in the case of Fiji, uh, in previous years, most likely to do anything to get what you want. And uh, what is it? Poo? So uh, there are all kinds of negative consequences of a military development in, in many ways. Uh, and the, so uh, the question by my friend, uh, Quickly, Ralph, to, uh, to, 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 to do with what exactly do you want? I mean, uh, I've written somewhere, I'll send you some of the papers. Uh, uh, because the potential for cooperation in the marketplace is there. I mean, your stereotyping of the two ethnic groups yes. as being naturally at odds with each other. They fight each other until death, like the uh, John Locke notion of uh, uh, we are actually driven by, uh, by, by self-interest. It's probably not very true in the context of the way in which there have been a lot of cases of cooperation. And what you need to do is create the condition for cooperation between Like business, for instance. How can the, the two work together in terms of, uh, because what, one of the things which affirmative action, affirmative action has done is to create that, if you like, almost a part-time business uh, gap between the two. Regions operate in one corner and the Indians in another. Uh, when in fact, instead of competing, as you rightly said, because Indians have a, a head start, uh, it's important to see how the two can... Uh, there have been some cases of that happening. And like land leases, for instance. Uh, the land leases is very much... Uh, Indians, uh, they farm on the land and they pay rent to the Fijians. So the Fijian participation is very, very passive. So what I'm arguing in that paper, which I'll send you, is how some of the business acumen of Indians can be shared by Fijians and how they can fall together, perhaps innovatively produce rather than uh, uh, have a production system which is based on a very much ethnic uh, you know, differentiation. And of course, the fact that uh, 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 the notion of Fijians being indigenous is in many ways unpushing. I mean, it's there, it's already in the Bolivian Kambula, as you know, and uh, therefore. Uh, it's something which they are of, and it's something which sustains the sense of identity. And sometimes, uh, in a positive way, sometimes in a way which, again, creates tension. So it's a, it's a much more complex situation rather than simply uh, being here or there. Anyway, sorry, I hope you're satisfied. <laughs> We've got we've got a few minutes, just a few minutes. So I'll be I'll be quick. Hopefully, uh, injecting some food for thought. First of all, I, I celebrate you all for for giving these presentations, which dissent from much has that has been said earlier. And a conference is entirely boring if everybody agrees with each other. <laughs> There's no use of having a conference. 